Today we're going to close out, formally close out, our discussion of Puritanism in our course American Literature to 1865 or American Literature through the Civil War. As we'll see, we don't totally ever completely leave Puritanism behind. Strains of Puritanism, I think, could be seen to have run all the way through, through our culture even today. But as a literary unit, as a constrained period of time, our discussion of Puritanism uh, comes to an end uh, today with an analysis of Mary Rowlandson's uh, captivity narrative uh, in the Norton Anthology. Um, as always, we're using the Norton Anthology of American Literature, 10th edition, uh, in reference to all page numbers and quotes. Uh, the captivity narrative was a popular genre at the time, and it experienced a resurgence of popularity in the 1800s as a relationship between the United States government and the Native American population uh, grew more tense again. But the captivity narrative as a genre doesn't refer exclusively to the relationship that the European uh, colonists and settlers and conquerors had with indigenous populations. When we think about the, the concept of the captivity narrative as a literary genre, it, uh, I think, could be thought of as uh, some sort of prose styling, typically autobiographical, as it is in Rowlandson's case, a prose account of a member of a dominant culture taken, quote, captive by an enemy culture. Now, in the time of the Puritans, uh, this takes the form of the relationship of European settlers, colonists, uh, and the relationship with the native indigenous population. But the captivity narrative or the conventions of the captivity narrative can apply to almost anything. Uh, there could be a science fiction story about someone who is abducted by aliens and held hostage by aliens, and that would follow conventionally the, the, the narrative progress of the captivity narrative. Typically, though, when we think about this, um, captivity narratives have a few things in common with each other, and we'll especially want to pay attention to the way that that appears inside Rowlandson's narrative, and we'll also want to think about how it fits into the broader Puritan movement in general. So what are some of the characteristics or genre characteristics of the captivity narrative? Typically, the captivity narrative is designed to be some sort of thriller, some sort of question of uh, how is this person going to escape captivity? There's usually some sort of preceding event, sometimes associated with violence, in which a person is taken captive or taken hostage by a perceived group of, um, a, a, a perceived enemy. Uh, and there's a thriller component of what's going to happen to this person while they're in captivity. Sometimes, I mean, the, the way that the narrative unfolds intellectually might cause some questions about will this person get out alive? But I think we know already if the captivity narrative is being written by the person who was taken captive, that that person is going to get out alive to be able to tell their tale. So there's a thriller component to it. You maybe know that the person will escape captivity, but you don't know how, you don't know what's going to happen to them along the way. Many times a captivity narrative is going to engage in 
propaganda. It may not be explicitly labeled as propaganda, but the story of an us versus them through the lens of someone taken captive, the us referring to whatever the dominant culture is and the them referring to whatever the perceived enemy culture is, is going to have some sort of depiction about what makes the quote unquote enemy culture our enemy. What characteristics do they have? Uh, in that particular way, we might think of this as being defined as a construction of the other. The other is a literary concept that refers to uh, uh, an author's uh, or a culture's construction of people who are not like the dominant culture. The point here is to try to draw binary oppositions between cultures. One culture does A, one culture does B. B is not like A. They are the other to A. So through this sort of construction of the other, there's a form of propaganda that can be at work. The captivity narrative also has at its core a test or trial of someone's faith. Now in Rowlandson's case, as you know from reading the narrative, this is an actual test or trial of her faith, a self-analysis of her faith, her shortcomings as a Christian woman, what might she or her community have done to uh, deserve what has happened to her. But you could conceive of a captivity narrative in which what's being tested or the faith is perhaps maybe a, the faith in an institution, the faith in um, a moral order, a faith in uh, security mechanisms, faith in uh, uh, the, the team or what is going to be uh, maybe perceived as the ability of someone to endure and survive, a psychological realm of faith. Uh, maybe a test of someone's sanity is a kind of faith. So I don't necessarily want you to think of the word faith as wholly tied to the religious realm, though in Rowlandson's captivity, it very much is tied to the religious realm. The captivity narrative, as we said, can be adapted as well. It can explore uh, different cultures, different ideas. Uh, someone can shipwreck and be taken captive. It can be part of a prison narrative. It can be an alien abduction story, uh, so on and so forth. It's not just restricted to the context that we have today. The only other point that I want to make about something that captivity narratives can do that can be really interesting and it's almost always built into the idea. Whenever you have a construction of the other, that comes hand in hand with what we might think of as a deconstruction of the other, and also a deconstruction of one's faith. In other words, there's something about the idea that once you're taken captive, you're held as a hostage, or you're held in ransom, or you are um, being used as some sort of bargaining chip or you're being used as some sort of political maneuver against somebody else. It allows the individual to engage in a lot of reflection. And just as a text can have a construction of the other, it can also have a deconstruction of the other. So let's use the Rowlandson text just as an example of this. We have 
inside Rowlandson's captivity narrative a construction of the other, descriptions of how she perceives the Native Americans as acting in this conflict that has arisen. King Philip's war, as it was called, uh, brought uh, uh, a confederation of Native people against the colonists. There is fear of encroaching into territory, there are some deaths that happen, and the two sides go to war with each other. So we have Rowlandson's depiction of a wartime enemy as part of her captivity narrative. And as part of that, we can anticipate that she's going to be relying on stereotypes and she's going to be relying on a certain political lens of understanding her captors. But I think much to the surprise of Rowlandson, there's also a deconstruction of the other. There are surprisingly human, surprisingly for her, human moments and interactions that happen. A step that gets us closer to seeing that the people who uh, are perceived to be enemies by one group are nevertheless people. They also have wants, they also have desires, they also have needs, they also have flaws. In other words, in a highly polarized environment like a war, it's easy to dehumanize the side that you were fighting against. But what a captivity narrative does is it takes one person from one side and puts them into the other side so that they can see how the other side functions. There can be a humanizing element or a way in which, even though we have a propagandistic construction of the other, Details can emerge in the text that have a deconstruction of that propaganda, a way in which the text undermines its version of events, maybe in a way that the author is subtly doing, but also maybe in a way that the author isn't quite in control of. There could also be a deconstruction of the faith. Uh, some people in that test or the trial of faith, the typical outcome of captivity narrative is that the person endures the challenge to their faith and they emerge with stronger faith on the other side. But that's not necessarily the case. Somebody can perhaps lose faith or begin to question things that they never thought was possible. So let's talk a little bit about Rowlandson's narrative, and let's do some close reading of passages from Rowlandson's narrative as we begin to try to understand it a little more. As we mentioned, the catalyst event here has been called King Philip's War. The Wampanoag leader, Metacom, uh, one of the names that was given to him by the colonists was King Philip. So when we talk about King Philip, we're talking about the leader of the, the Wampanoag people, and his name is Metacom. Metacom organizes a series of attacks on New England settlements, uh, and the catalyst, the catalyst event here are food shortages, uh, uh, loss of sovereignty over their territory, you know, they're, the, they're losing control of their lands to the European settlers, and also fear of further expansion. What is going to happen as people begin expanding further west, off of the coasts and into the interior of America? Uh, the, the, the war itself uh, led uh, many hun left many hundreds dead. So we're not dealing here with just a few people, though that would be a tragedy in and of itself. We're dealing with hundreds of people and the, uh, a, an incredible amount of destruction of property. Rowlandson is uh, the wife of a minister, uh, and his name is Joseph. Uh, and they are uh, originally from uh, England, and they have immigrated to the colonies. So 
So we're still dealing with authors who were born in Europe and have come over into the American colonies. Uh, and during this time, she and her husband are separated from each other. Her house is overtaken. She is taken captive uh, along with a sick child. Her other children are also taken and she's separated from them. And after she's uh, released and she returns back with the guidance of her husband, her minister husband, she writes this prose account of her captivity. It's a very popular book in the North American colonies and also in England, which is one of the reasons why we want to have it inside our course on American literature. It's an early prose text um, that is popular in the culture and also is a very interesting text from a literary perspective. The text, as you know, is structured in what are called removes. And these are essentially movements from place to place. And so Rowlandson has this sort of chapter-like structure where it's like we moved here, that's the first remove, then we moved here, that's the second remove, then we moved here, that's the third remove. And it provides a sense of structure and time for her uh, and allows her to uh, show the entire journey that she's taken on during the uh, few weeks that she's held um, uh, by the, the Wampanoag people. The text is written in a Puritan style. So we talked about the Puritan style when we looked at uh, Bradford and Winthrop and Bradstreet, how it's uh, largely a very traditional style uh, without a lot of poetic ornamentation to it. It's usually very direct. The descriptions are very clear and succinct. There's not a lot of figurative language, figurative language being um, metaphors and similes and personification and ideas that are going to uh, engage in what we might think of as the literary. Uh, so the text is written in that fashion. And we can tell uh, because the text was sort of co-sponsored by the men in Rowlandson's life, and those men are political leaders and also religious leaders, that there's a, a motive uh, to this particular uh, type of story. That it's not purely an autobiographical or a memoir or an essay on somebody's experiences, but there's a larger theme that's trying to be built. This is sometimes group into, we talked about this, the, the genre of the captivity narrative, but it's sometimes grouped into the religious genre of what's called the Jeremiad. The Jeremiad comes, the name comes from the prophet Jeremiah, one of the major prophets of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. Um, and the Jeremiah is a type of uh, prose work, could be a speech, could be a narrative, that sort of bemoans and criticizes and worries about a culture that's lost its way. So a culture losing its way. And with that, a prophecy of punishment, a prophecy of doom or downfall that comes with that. And this is, of course, based on the prophet Jeremiah and his interactions with Israel, the Israelites, fearing, foretelling that, they're, that they've lost their way in the eyes of God and that destruction will fall upon them. They've lost the terms of the covenant, and God is going to punish them as a result of that. So we can also think of this uh, narrative from Rowlandson as fitting into that genre as well. That goes a long way toward explaining the copious amount of biblical citations. So this is not a, a sermon 
that Rawlinson is delivering, but it is in a number of ways that has sermon-like qualities about it. So we have two sort of literary genres that are in tension with each other, right? We have the Puritan Christian sermon structure, similar to what we saw with John Winthrop and some of Bradford's writings, what we'll see also on display uh, to an extent in the works of Jonathan Edwards, when we turn to him next. But we also have here the autobiography, the memoir, the essay, and not just an autobiography or memoir or essay, but one written by a woman, which makes it even more interesting to us because it's not the voice that we typically get in the culture. So we don't know exactly how many things in the text go, come you know, exclusively from Rowlandson, what role her husband may have played in suggesting that she add things or take things out. There's a lot about the text that we don't know, but we can look at what we have and we can form educated guesses based on some of the information that we have here. So let's turn to the opening of the narrative. And let's talk about some of the interesting literary uh, things that we notice. First, since this is the first week of our course and we're really focusing on the, uh, sorry, the second week of our course, and we're still focusing on the development of re critical reading skills and how do we uh, form interpretations based on texts, we always want to make sure that we're paying attention to the footnotes especially for some of these older texts whose historical moments or some of the references we might not get immediately. But always pay attention to the footnotes. Interestingly enough, the title of the text as listed in your anthology is not the same as the title of the text when it was first published. The Nord Anthology sort of abbreviates the title of the text as a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson. So we have her name front and center, her experiences front and center. But as footnote number one tells you, the actual title of the text is as follows. The sovereignty and goodness of God, together with the faithfulness of his promises displayed, being a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson, commended by her to all that desires to know the Lord's doings to and dealings with her, especially to her dear children and relations. The second edition, corrected and amended, written by her own hand for her private use and now made public at the earnest desire of some friends and for the benefit of the afflicted. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, neither is there any can deliver out of my hand. So the original title of the text puts the emphasis on God in a way that really shouldn't surprise us for Puritan literature, right? We've talked so much already about the, the God's providence, God's uh, blessings, God's grace, playing a, an integral role in how the Puritans understand their relationship to the world, the relationship to God, and the relationship to literature. Rowlandson uh, is, is halfway through the title, or maybe not all the way, halfway through the title, but she shows up in the second part of the title, and you can see that it's been abbreviated down to a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson. It might be interesting to talk about what is changed, what is lost, what is gained by making God the centerpiece of the title, as opposed to making Rowlandson the centerpiece of the title. Would Rowlandson or the people who worked with her on this text, the friends mentioned in the title of the text, 
Uh, how would they feel about the Norton Anthology listing its title as a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson? What would they think is lost? What would they think is potentially gained? Rowlandson uh, does not give us much backstory. She opens immediately on the day, the event, the moment that things are happening as the text comes together. Note the images of violence. On the 10th of February, 1675, came the Indians with great numbers upon Lancaster. Their first coming was about sunrising. Hearing the noise of some guns, we looked out. Several houses were burning and the smoke ascending to heaven. There were five persons taken in one house, the father and the mother and the sucking child. They knocked on the head. The other two they took and carried away alive. There were two others who being out of their garrison upon some occasion were sat upon. One was knocked on the head and the other escaped. Another there was who was running along was shot and wounded and fell down. He begged for his life promising them money, as they told me. But they would not hearken to him, but knocked him in the head and stripped him naked and split open his bowels. She refers to the native people as, quote, these murderous wretches. And it's not the only time in the text that she's going to reserve very harsh language to describe the indigenous people. So she tells us what she's doing here. At the top of page 264, she says kind of what her purpose is. What's, what's the, uh, the goal of this text? And she tells us, I had often before this said that if the Indians should come, I should choose rather to be killed by them than taken alive. But when it came to the trial, my mind changed. These glittering weapons so daunted my spirit that I chose rather to go along with those, as I may say, ravenous beasts, than that moment to end my days. And that I may the better declare what happened to me during that grievous captivity, I shall particularly speak of the several removes we had up and down the wilderness. And she opens, again, the very propagandistic view of how she understands the native people. At the opening of the first remove, on page 264. Now away we must go with those barbarous creatures, with our bodies wounded and bleeding and our hearts no less than our bodies. About a mile we went that night up upon a hill within sight of the town where they intended to lodge. There was hard by a vacant house, deserted by the English before, for fear of the Indians. I asked them whether I might not lodge in the house that night, to which they answered, What, will you love Englishmen still? This was the dolefulest night that ever my eyes saw. Oh, the roaring and singing and dancing and yelling of those black creatures in the night, which made the place a lively resemblance of hell. She says there's nobody for her but for her sick child uh, that she is caring for. A lot of the images here have uh, reminders or perhaps echoes of the sort of ravaging wilderness that Bradford describes in Of Plymouth Plantation. She describes the wilderness as vast and desolate on page 265. Uh, she talks about the uh, weakness that she has of going uphill on steep hills. She talks about the cold winter night upon the cold snowy ground with my sick child in my arms looking that every hour would be the last of its life and having no Christian friend near me, either to comfort or help me. So the, the natural world around her is cruel 
and harsh. And she feels that she is surrounded by people who are cruel and harsh, that to the point of she is dehumanizing them. She feels alone. Her child is sick. She has no one else. What has she done to deserve this fate? That's where the Jeremiah idea is coming in. What has she done to deserve the pain, the suffering, the agony that she is going through? Well, the invitation here to examine her own faith leads her to a what might seem to us to be a surprising conclusion, but maybe it wouldn't have been so surprising for the Puritans. The bottom of page 265. She tells us what she think, m thinks might be the cause of it. The next day was the Sabbath, she writes near the bottom of the page. I then remembered how careless I had been of God's holy time, how many Sabbaths I had lost and misspent, and how evilly I had walked in God's sight, which lay so close unto my spirit, that it was easy for me to see how righteous it was with God to cut off the thread of my life and cast me out of his presence forever. Yet the Lord still showed mercy to me and upheld me, and as he wounded me with one hand, so he healed me with the other. So what has she done to deserve this? Right? In a perhaps objective or neutral or secular sense, we might just chalk it up to bad luck. Right? She's at the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, we might draw back, in her particular case, she's the victim of bad luck, but the overall framework that might have caused it is the relationship between the settlers and the native people the food problems, the scarcity of food, the fears of territorial expansion, the fears of co colonial expansion are part of what's brought these two forces in to fight with each other. And once the fighting has begun, Rollinson simply in the wrong place at the wrong time and is able to find herself taken captive. But that explanation would not be suitable for a Puritan, as you know. From our discussion of Bradford and our discussion of Winthrop, remember, everything that happens in the Puritan worldview can be traced back to God's predestination of events. That there is a reason that everything has happened. It's all part of a plan. And because there's a reason for everything that has happened, then everything that happens can be analyzed for what its possible reasons are. And Rowlandson's conclusion in all of this is that what is happening to her must have happened because she did not always honor the Sabbath one of the Ten Commandments. And that had she been a better honorer of the Sabbath, perhaps this would not have happened. A sense in which a community is losing its way, not living up to the standards that it holds for itself. And when that happens, that's when punishment follows in the Jeremiah structure the sermon structure, the prophetic structure of why bad things happen to people. Okay. We could, although the text makes numerous citations to the book of Job, we could uh, perhaps contrast this to the book of Job, where bad things befall a man. The book of Job, of course, from the Hebrew Bible through the Christian Old Testament, uh, where bad things happen to a man as a result of a bet made between uh, God and God's uh, adversary on earth. 
the bet that gets made to bring bad things upon Job is never resolved. When Job asks for an explanation as to why bad things are happening, uh, God answers in the whirlwind to uh, Job, basically, how dare you ask me that? You will never understand my ways. You cannot ever understand my ways. And so there's an attempt here to try to understand the ways. And from Rowlandson's perspective, she falls back on sins that she has committed. That explains why this is happening to her. That might be part of the larger purpose of the text. The Jeremiah structure of trying to warn readers, change your ways, or bad things like this will continue to happen to you. But of course, we're also interested in the moments where Rowlandson's personal voice is able to break through, where we sort of lose the overall structure of thinking about this in a sermonic uh, 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 genre and think more about it from the perspective of a memoir genre that sort of tracks Rowlandson's trauma and how she reacts to it. I wanted to read, it's a difficult passage to read, but I wanted to take a close look at the passage where she describes the death of her daughter, her sick daughter, whom she has been caring for. This is in the third remove. It's at the bottom of page 266 in our edition of the text. It's about halfway down the page, down to the bottom of the page. About two hours in the night, my sweet babe, like a lamb, departed this life on February 18th, 1675, it being about six years and five months old. It was nine days from the first wounding in this miserable condition without any refreshing of one nature or another except a little cold water. I cannot but take notice at how another time I could not bear to be in the room where any dead person was. But now the case is changed. I must and could lie down by my dead babe, side by side, all the night after. I have thought since of the wonderful goodness of God to me in preserving me in the use of my reason and senses in that distressed time that I did not use wicked and violent means to end my own miserable life. In the morning when they understood that my child was dead, they sent me home to my master's wigwam. By my master, in this writing, must be understood Quinnipen, who was a sagamore and married King Philip's wife's sister. Not that he first took me, but I was sold to him by another Narragansett Indian who took me when I first came out of the garrison. I went to take up my dead child in my arms to carry it with me, but they bid me let it alone. There was no resisting, but go I must and leave it. When I had been at my master's wigwam, I took the first opportunity I could to, let, to look after my dead child. When I came, I asked what they had done with it. Then they told me it was upon the hill. Then they went and showed me where it was, where I saw the ground was newly digged. And there they told me they had buried it. There I left that child in the wilderness and must commit it and myself also in this wilderness condition to him who is above all. I find this passage very extraordinary uh, for the insight we get into Rowlandson's psychology at this time. We have two direct references to God in the passage, but they are unlike other references to God in the narrative. Many times when God is referred to in the narrative, it is in the sense of a religious worshipfulness or a citation of biblical passages. Note in the passage that I just read, we have no biblical passages that are cited. Instead, our first reference to God in the passage 
is in Rollinson thanking God for helping her stay sane enough that she does not commit suicide. The depths of her grief so much on display. The next reference to God is the idea that she has left her child in the wilderness to God, that she's given over her child to God through her child's death. It's interesting in this text that there's ambiguity around Rowlandson's interactions with the Native Americans at this time. She says, once they realize the child was dead, they send her away. It's different, it's difficult. She wants to take her child with her at this moment, but they, they, they make her not do that. She doesn't put up a fight, right? She listens, she does what they tell her to do. And she goes to Quinnipin's tent to talk to him. And then as soon as she's done, the first thing she wants to do is find her child. And when she finally gets back looking for her child, that's when she finds out that the child has been buried. Now you could interpret this moment in a couple of ways, right? But notably, I think Rowlandson does not interpret it for us. She does not chastise, name call, engage in racism or xenophobia in the same way that she does in other passages. The Native Americans at this point are not compared to demons dancing around a fire as she has compared them previously. Once they find out her child is dead, she is sent away. Why? One possible interpretation here is they know how distressing this moment is for her. And they take it upon themselves to find a reason to separate her from the dead child after the period of time has passed and they bury the child for her. This is a, an act of humanity an act of kindness that is performed for her to help her through her grief. She's not angry about this. She presents it more matter-of-factly. And that's one of the interesting stylistic choices that's in the text. When she is angry at the Native people, she really uses harsh rhetoric. But note the times when she doesn't. What is happening at those times? Often a level of kindness is happening at those times. Or often she is experiencing emotions that she can't fully process. She never has anything exactly nice to say in the text about the Native Americans. But she, there are moments where she doesn't have anything cruel to say about them. And that's moments that we could look to and draw attention to. Let's turn to the end of the captivity narrative of the Rollinson. We're going to start on page 292. And I want to think about how Rollinson brings her narrative to a close after she returns home and eventually is reunited with her husband and then eventually reunited with her surviving children. Rowlandson would not have had the vocabulary to talk about something in terms of PTSD, but when you read the text through that modern lens of understanding what PTSD is, you can see in the text where she has it. And this starts at the bottom of 292. 
I can remember the time when I used to sleep quietly without workings in my thoughts, whole nights together. But now it is other ways with me. When all are fast about me and no eye open, but his who ever waketh, my thoughts are on upon things past, upon the awful dispensation of the Lord towards us, upon his wonderful power and might in carrying us through so many difficulties, in returning us to safety and suffering none to hurt us. I remember in the night season how the other day I was in the midst of thousands of enemies and nothing but death before me. It was then hard work to persuade myself that ever I should be satisfied with bread again. But now we are fed with the finest of the wheat and, as I may say, with honey out of the rock. Instead of the husk, we have the fatted calf. She says, Oh, the wonderful power of God that mine eyes have seen, affording matter enough for my thoughts to run in that when others are sleeping, mine eyes are waking. I have seen the extreme vanity of the world, and vanity here means uh, emptiness, futility, per your footnote. One hour I have been in health and wealthy, wanting nothing, but the next hour in sickness and wounds and death having nothing but sorrow and affliction. She talks about using her sleeplessness to think about the awesome power of God and to think about how lucky she is that she survived. But I think we can see in this description at least a sense of insomnia that can accompany a traumatic event, an inability to sleep, Right? Note that she draws attention to just that everyone else around her is sleeping and she's, she can't, she's awake and she cries at night as a result of what has happened. But ultimately, though this is a memoir and an opportunity for a woman in the Puritan world to tell her own story, her own voice, her own story, her own narrative is ultimately always secondary or subservient to the larger Puritan message that the text is trying to impart. And so the text does not end there with a focus on her, but the text ends instead, as most Puritan texts do, with a focus on God. She writes, Yet I see when God calls a person to anything and through never so many difficulties, yet he is fully able to carry them through and make them see and say they have been gainers thereby. And I hope I can say in some measure, as David did, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. The Lord hath showed me the vanity of these outward things, that they are the vanity of vanities, the vexation of spirit, that they are but a shadow and a blast, a bubble, and things of no continuance. That we must rely on God himself, and our whole dependence must be upon him. If trouble from smaller matters begin to arise in me, I have something at hand to check myself with and say, why am I troubled? It was but the other day, that if I had had the world, I would have given it for my freedom or to have been a servant to a Christian. I have learned to look beyond present and smaller troubles and to be quieted under them. As Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. She has endured a traumatic experience and she's using that to bring into check her feelings on smaller challenges that she is facing but still, the focus is away from her and toward the community, or away from her and toward God. But yet there are tensions in the text, right? 
And so as we bring our unit on the Puritans to a close, if there's an idea that can come out of here that we might want to carry forward with us as we continue reading this course, it might be this. As we read contextually, as we look at a text in its historical moment and how the text reflects its historical moment, it helps to understand the philosophies, the ideologies, the principles that are built into that historical moment. For the Puritans, it's a valuing of the society over the individual. It's a valuing of the glory of God over the expression of emotion in a literary text. Giving glory to God and turning attention away from the self. And if we have that idea in mind, and we can say, okay, this is the dominant value inside the culture, this is what the culture is trying to show in its artistic output, we can clearly find examples of that. But there is also great value in being able to think about the way in which the texts that come out of that society also seem to push against it or to rebel against those standards in the way that Bradstreet's poems both conform to the Puritan expectation, but also seem to rebel against the Puritan expectation. Rowlandson's narrative both conforms to the Puritan expectation, but also seems to rebel to it. It's as if she's sort of caged in by the standards of her society, and she's letting out little moments that allow us to see deeper, more individualistic experiences. Experiences that move away from a sermonic structure and instead think more about the memoir aspect. The value to the text is, of course, the sovereignty and goodness of God in the original title. But we can take a look at the text and understand that while at the same time understanding that it's also the narrative of Mary Rowlandson and her perspective, her experiences are also highly valuable in how we can take information away from this text and think about the historical moment of the Puritans, but also think about what are the dominant values in our own culture and how are people's voices still trying to break free or working within the currents of the dominant culture.